contribution of John Stuart Mill in psychology was inspired by John Locke and David Hume. Now, his methodological contribution, he found inspiration in the work of Francis Bacon. He followed the inductive approach of Francis Bacon. Let's recap Bacon's method. First, collect all relevant data without presuppositions. Second, analyze the data to detect correlations. Third, extend experimentation to test possible correlations, formation of hypotheses, and further testing. If confirmed, elevate hypotheses to laws of nature. Now, I have to say the hypotheses that Francis Bacon is proposing here are not the same hypotheses that we typically use in research nowadays. So, John Stuart Mill had a controversy with another methodologist, William Hewell, in which um, John Stuart Mill, discussing the hypotheses of Kepler when introduced to explain the trajectory of the planets, that the trajectory was elliptical, Mill said that um, idea comes from the environment. The trajectory is there in the environment, whereas Hewell, for him, that is a hypothesis that comes from the mind. So, in the sense of hypotheses, uh, Bacon and Mill, they are talking about patterns that are observable in the environment. Oh, let's now move to uh, John Stuart Mill's own methods. He proposed five methods. Method of agreement, method of difference, joint method of agreement and difference, the method of residue, and the method of concomitant variation. Let's start with the method of agreement. So, in order to describe those methods, he developed five canons. So, the first canon belongs to the method of agreement. And it goes like this. If two or more instances of the phenomenon under investigation have only one circumstance in common, the circumstance in which alone all the instances agree is the cause or effect of the given phenomenon. So, in the graph we've got two instances of a phenomenon of interest. We, in this case, P1 is the phenomenon, phenomenon of, of interest. So these are two instances in which P1 occurs. That corresponds to the first canon. If two or more instances of the phenomenon under investigation, so that's this part. And the second part is have only one circumstance in common. So here A1 is the circumstance in common in these two instances. Um, but B1 and B2 are not the same, so these are not in common. Okay, so what Mill says next is the circumstance in which alone all these instances agree, which is A1, is the cause or the effect of the given phenomenon. So it's the cause or the effect of P1. Let's illustrate this with an example. So in the first instance, we've got a class of, uh, in a school, uh, class one, and the teacher is quite knowledgeable. So being, the teacher being knowledgeable is what we call A1. And he is also charismatic. And being charismatic, we call it B1. And their academic performance, the academic performance of the students, is high. That's P1, which is the phenomenon of interest. So we've got a class in which the academic performance is high, we've got a knowledgeable teacher, 
and we've got a charismatic teacher. Now, let's see another instance of the same phenomenon. So the phenomenon is that we've got a class with high academic performance. So this is the second instance is class number two. It also has a knowledgeable teacher and this teacher is non-charismatic. Now their performance is high as before. So in this method of agreement, A1 and P1 occur together. Um, B1 occurs in one instance and we can say B1 is the cause of P1, but because we've got in another instance P1 without B1, then B1 cannot be the cause. B2 cannot be the cause because B2 is here and, and, uh, and it's not there and, and we still observe the phenomenon. So now Mill says something very interesting. What he says is that that um, circumstance, A1, is the cause, but it could also be the effect. So let's illustrate this with a connection between A1 and P1, but we don't have an arrow because we cannot establish causality. So it could be the other, the other way around. It could be that the phenomenon P1, which is the class has high performance, causes E1, having a knowledgeable teacher. So it could be that the authorities of the school put the, the students with um, high performance with the teacher that uh, is quite knowledgeable. So it's not the teaching um, of, the, of the teacher that caused the high performance. It could be, it could be, but it could also be that the, that the performance of the students um, influenced, influenced the, um, the, um, the teacher who was assigned to that class. So this is a method that Mill says, well, it's not a very strong method. We cannot establish uh, causality. We can, um, uh, we can use it to investigate further the relationship between A1 and P1. Also, we need to try more instances in which we've got um, other variables like C, let's say C1, some, something, something else. Uh, but we have C1 and then C1 is not there, like C2. So we, we have circumstances in which we add more, more um, instances in which we add more circumstances and we want to identify the circumstance that is always there and, uh, and, and um, with many other circumstances. And that circumstance that is always, th always there when the phenomenon occurs then it has to be related. It could be the effect or could be the cause. So let's move to the method of difference. And the method of difference was uh, the method that Mill said it was a very strong method. It was much stronger that, than the method of agreement. Okay, so, so the second canon is related to the method of difference. It goes like this. If an instance in which the phenomenon under investigation occurs and an instance in which it doesn't occur have every circumstance in common save one, that one occurring only in the former, the circumstance in which alone the two instances differ is the effect or the cause or an indispensable part of the cause of the phenomenon. Okay, so let's go by parts. If an instance in which the phenomenon under investigation occurs. So now the phenomenon under investigation is called P1, but it's different than in the previous case, but uh, we've got P1 here. Um, and an instance in which it doesn't occur. So the second instance is here. P1 does not occur. So that's reflected in this graph. Have every circumstance in common save one. Okay, so the two instances have the same, um, the same circumstances in common save one. So 
we've got A1 and Q1 there, and A1 and Q1 there, and one circumstance is, is not there. So B1 is different than B2. Okay, so basically the idea of this method is that we need to have circumstances in which are uh, the phenomenon occurs, P1, and one where it doesn't occur, P2, and, and then other circumstances should be the same, like A1, Q1, A1, Q1. We can add more, like let's say C1 and, 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 and C, um, C1 and, and, and X1, uh, D1 and Y1, etc., etc. So these should be available in the two instances. But there should be one that is not the is, is in one of the instances but not in the other one. Not in the other one. So this in this is the case of P1. It's here, but not in there. He then says that the, the circumstance occurring only in the former, so that means that means B1 is occurring in B in, in circumstance one, in instance one, but not in instance two. is the effect or the cause and then he adds or an indispensable part of the cause of the phenomenon we talked about uh, this in the when we saw the causality ideas of, of John Stuart Mill and um, he mentioned that sometimes the, the causes are a, a conjunction of things not just one thing um, so that's what he's referring to here so Basically, let's see one example here. Uh, in the first instance, we've got class one has a knowledgeable and charismatic teacher. So knowledgeable, we say A1, charismatic, B1, and their academic performance is high, that's Q1, but that's not the phenomenon of, of interest in this case. It was the phenomenon of interest in, in, the, in the previous example, but not in this one. And the student satisfaction, this is the phenomenon of interest, is high. That's P1. Okay, now in second instance, we've got class number two as a knowledgeable teacher, A1, um, high performance, high academic performance. So that is exactly the same as before. But then the, we've got a non charismatic teacher, B2 and we don't observe a <clears throat> high satisfaction in the students. We've got low satisfaction. So phenomenon P1, high satisfaction, does not occur. So he says the, um, the instances, the, the circumstances that were different is the cause or the effect of the phenomenon. So again, we exemplify by, by establishing a link, but we cannot establish a causal link. Mill is cautious there. The only way we can establish a causal link if we have a control in which we uh, assign people randomly to these two conditions. So we can um, assign randomly students to a charismatic teacher and a non-charismatic teacher but the, the, the allocation of students to those teachers was randomly done and then if we observe that that uh, p1 occurs so people uh, students are satisfied then then we can establish that a causal relationship but if we didn't do this um, causal uh, this uh, random allocation if we just observe then it could be p1 could be the effect of p1 so when we observe students that are satisfied we may assign a charismatic teacher to them so we don't know whether which one is the cause or which one is the effect but we definitely know that they are related one is the cause and the other is the effect